Good evening, Island Church. It's great to see you all out on a Wednesday night. Welcome to our refuel service. Can I just get everyone to stand up and we're just going to pray before we start? Thank you, Lord. Heavenly Father, we just thank you, Lord, for this service tonight, Father. We thank you, Lord, for another opportunity, Lord, to gather in your name. I thank you, Lord, for John as he ministers the word this evening, Father God, Lord, that his confidence comes from you, Father. I thank you for the word that you've put in his heart, Lord. 
I thank you, Father God, for your Holy Spirit flowing through him this evening, Father God. I thank you, Lord, that every word, Father God, is going to be sown on good ground in our hearts, Lord, because we've taken the time, Father God, to cultivate our heart, to get that ground ready, Lord, for your word to be planted tonight, Father God. I just thank you, Lord, for your goodness, for your kindness, for your mercy, for your grace, Lord, for your faithfulness towards us, Father God. Lord, I just thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to minister to you this evening, Father God, because you are worthy of it all, Lord. You're worthy of all our praise, all the honor, Father God. We just thank you, Father God, now. We praise you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I thank you, Lord, that you created in us a clean heart. Free from all unrighteousness, Father God. Thank you, Lord, that you are shaping us more and more into your image every single day. And I thank you, Lord, for these people that have come out this evening, Lord, that your word says that you reward those who diligently seek you, Lord. And Lord, you see their hearts. We just thank you, Father God, now for a wonderful time in your presence. In Jesus' name, amen.
somebody else like you. No one can come close to you, Lord. for you Jesus Jesus oh church if we could only train ourselves to keep our eyes upon him that is the that is the number one trick and tool of the enemy is to get get our eyes looking back at ourselves you know why because he can remind you of the mistakes so he can remind you of the sin. He can remind you of when you've messed up. He can remind you of when you didn't do what you were supposed to do or say what you were supposed to say. He can remind you of your failures. And it's okay when things are going well, but when things are going bad, we get ourselves in this dark hole ourselves. Because when our eyes are fixed on Jesus, because let me tell you, this week we're celebrating it on his last days on this earth, before he went to the cross to take your sin, to take your shame. To take your guilt upon himself our sickness, our disease, our iniquity, our unrighteousness upon his sinless body. So let me tell you this, if you're thinking of your, your pitfalls and your downfalls, I want you to look at them upon the body of Jesus because that's where they are. See, if you're in him, if you've accepted him, if you've received him as your Lord and your Savior, those things have no hold over you anymore. He's taken them from, for you. And you're now in him. You're now abiding in him, which means everything that he is and everything that he has, it belongs to us, church. And if we can keep our eyes on the King, if we can keep our eyes upon Jesus, we won't be focused on any of those things. We'll just see him. We'll see him rightly. We'll see him for who he is. And when the devil tries to come and remind us of those things, we can see Jesus and that he took them for us. We can see, when we're looking at Jesus, we can see his love. We can see his grace. We can see his mercy towards us. So if there's people in here tonight that are caught up in the past, caught up in things that you haven't got right, things, mistakes that you've made, it, it, it has to end now because that stuff will, will just continue to eat away and eat away and eat away. It's time to, to lay that at the foot of the cross. It's time to lay that at Jesus' feet. Because that's where he bore it for you, church. And there's no one else like him. You can't find fulfillment in anything else or anyone else. You won't find it. You will not find it. You can search this earth high and low. You will not find anybody like him.
Thank you, Jesus. Oh, we remember you this evening, Lord. We remember what you've done for us. We remember you, Lord. As you, journey, as you made your journey towards the cross. And yes, Lord, nobody took your life. No particular people took your life. You gave it. For nobody could take his life, only he surrendered it willingly. So that you and so that I and so that this whole world could come to know him intimately. So that we could come to know him personally. So that we could come to walk with him every single day. In his love and in his joy and in his peace. You see, he died so that you could have a relationship with him. And he rose again on the third day. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. There's no one else like you. We honor you, Lord. We glorify you. We say, Lord, we're going to look to you. And when we catch ourselves looking at ourselves, when we catch ourselves looking at our mistakes and our failures, and we're going to quickly fix our gaze back upon you. Because you see us, Lord. You see our hearts. You see us, Lord. As being in you, you don't look at those things. You don't keep a record of those things, Lord. He doesn't keep a record of a church. You keep a record of it, but he doesn't. Release it to him and it's forgotten about. His forgiveness is there because he doesn't want you living in that anymore or like that anymore. He wants you to deliver. He wants you to come from that so that he can do his work in you and fulfill you like nothing else can. So we thank you for reminding us of your mercy tonight, Lord, and your grace and your love towards us. We thank you, Lord Jesus. We praise you, Lord. We thank you, Lord. Church, if anyone would like prayer for healing in their body, maybe, or just prayer over something I spoke about there, just, just for a touch from God, I'd like to do that for you this evening before we move on. Praise God he's so gracious and merciful thank you Lord
Lord Jesus, you're worthy. You're wonderful, Lord. You're wonderful, Lord. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for meeting here with us. Thank you for coming to be with us this evening, Lord. We know that you're, you're with us, you're in us, Lord, but we thank you for this corporate anointing. We thank you, Lord, for this tangible presence that's here to heal, that's here to set free, that's here to transform. And we welcome you in this place and we give you preeminence and we honor you and we say we're gathering here for you. Change us, Lord. Make us more like you in every way. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen. Praise God. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Praise God. Well, you're very welcome. Yeah, you can give us some light. You're very welcome to our Wednesday refuel service. I'm so glad that you're here. Amen. It's wonderful to be in the presence of God. Um, well, I'm just going to welcome Brother John up. He's going to be delivering the word this evening. And I just believe the word that God put in his heart is going to be a blessing to us all, a blessing to this congregation. He's, uh, he's been ministering the word for a long time, and he has been such, such a, a faithful man of God and such a, a pioneer and dear to my heart. So I love every time I get to hear from him. So welcome him as he comes. Amen. Praise God. Good evening. Are you all well? Didn't we have a great weekend? I certainly did anyway. It was, uh, did you all enjoy it? Yeah, it was. I really feel that, um, you know, God was really strengthening this church over the weekend and uh, uh, just strengthening our marriages and our relationships and um, he, he sent us some great people and uh, personally I was really blessed by their ministry. So anyway, you're all very welcome tonight. Um, if you don't know me, I'm John. And uh, um, So I want to continue, um, I think at the end of January I spoke on just the brethren, the the, the family of the church and I'd like to just pick up where we left off and kind of go another a bit and look at a few scriptures um, but I'd like to recap just a wee bit and um, you know if we're going to talk about in particular I want to talk about just the love for the brethren that it's all over the New Testament the importance of, of loving uh, loving each other and what that looks like um, and how powerful it is. Uh, it's the love of God in our hearts that we love each other with. And it's a powerful love. And, uh, but, you know, the, the scripture that, that really catches me is in, if you look over to First John, um, uh, let's see, First John 4 and verse 11. And he says here, John says, Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. Um, so, you know, our, um, if we're going to love one another, we're, we're loving because he first loved us. And, we, and so if we look at, how, well, how did God love us? Now, what did he do for us? That, that, and so the last time I just mentioned a few scriptures. So let's just, the obvious one, John three sixteen. God so loved the world that what did he do? He gave his only begotten son that whosoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. Um, Romans 5, 8 says, but God commends or exhibits his, his own love towards us that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. You know, that, that's the kind of love. You know, we didn't even know him. We weren't even born. 
and he was paying the price for us. Christ died for us. You know, while we were still sinners, Christ died for the ungodly, the righteous for the unrighteous. Um, and verse 10 says, when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son. And it goes on to say, we were, we'll be saved by his life. You know, when he was resurrected from the dead, he, he fully accomplished what he went to the cross for. And, and we're saved by his life. When he was resurrected from the dead, that was our victory when he was doing that. Um, he paid the price when he went to the cross. But when he r rose from the dead, he defeated death. Actually, uh, the Apostle Paul puts it this way. He says, he says I was crucified in Christ. Or, I was crucified with Christ, buried in baptism, and risen to new life in him. So when, he, when Jesus rose from the dead, Paul says, I was risen with him to new life. And so we are in Christ, you know. And from the moment that you receive Christ, he, you're placed into Christ. And so we're living in, in that life. And um, so if we're going to talk about loving our brethren, our family, our church family, then we, we need God's example. The example we have is that God sent his son to, to a cross to die a horrible death, to pay a price. And not alone did the father send the son, but then the son obeyed the father and went to the cross. And, and he defeated death on our behalf. And he, he, he basically handed us um, a righteousness that we didn't earn that he paid for um, and reconciled us to himself by his own sacrifice we didn't even do have anything to do with, it, with that reconciliation it was all him from the start to the finish and then we're, hand, we're said okay now in, in, uh, John says as many as receive him to them God gives the right or the privilege to become a son of God or a daughter of God. So all we've got to do is to receive and we're given a righteousness that we didn't pay for. And without going into tons of scriptures, where we've been, we've been brought into the family of God and um, we're now in Christ, we're sons and daughters of God in Christ and um, I think there's another great scripture about this um, let's see if I can find it well actually we're in First John so go back to verse 10 and he says here in verse 10 <clears throat> in this is love not that we loved God but that he loved us and sent his son to be a propitiation for our sins. And what, what does that mean? It means a full price. Propitiation means a full price. In this is love, that God loved us and sent his son to be a full price for our sins. <clears throat> Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. So the basis for us loving one another is his love. And you know, if I ever, I don't know about you guys, but if I ever have a struggle with a person in, in loving them or showing compassion to them, all I've got to do is rem re go back to my example. If God loved me in, in this way, then I ought to love my brother. And you know, if we go over to 1 Corinthians chapter 13, and because the world's, the world's um, love is not really, it's not really like this love. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse, uh, verse 4, it give, and from 4 down to about 7, it, te it tells us, if, if you haven't read this before, it tells us 
some of the qualities of the love of God. So when he tells us to love one another as he loved us, he, he's talking about these qualities here. Let's look at, look at them. Uh, verse 4 said, love suffers long or is long-suffering. And you know what long-suffering does? It enables people to change. It's the love of God. It keeps relationships together. It puts up with a lot. It, it's patient. It gives time. It endures long. That's what suffers long means. You know, it's, a, it's, it's the patience and putting up with stuff and sticking in, sticking there with, with the person, being patient, being um, uh, not quick to judge or jump in and, and condemn them. Love suffers long and is kind. It does not be... It does not envy, it does not parade itself, or it's not boastful. It's not puffed up with pride. It doesn't behave rudely or indecent or unmannerly. It does, it does not seek its own. There's a good one there. Love does, this, the God kind of love does not seek its own. You know, so much of the love that we see in the world is, is, is fickle and selfish. And it gives, but it really, it's really thinking about itself. It's a selfish. It gives to get. But, but the love of God does not uh, seek its own. It's not provoked. You know, when Jesus was going to the cross, they spat in his face, they ridiculed him, they said all kinds of things against him. But he wasn't provoked by that. Why? Because he was a, he was about to, to pay the price for their sin. The very ones that was cursing him out and, and saying terrible things to him. Um, he, was, he, he wasn't provoked by that. Um, and because his heartbeat was the heartbeat of God, the heartbeat of the Father. He was carrying out the Father's will. He was carrying out the mercy of, of God towards mankind. Love is not provoked. It thinks no evil. It does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. Look at this one. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things, and it never fails. Love never fails. That's the love of God. And so if God loved us in such a way that he, he sent his son to the cross, we ought to love one another <clears throat> with this kind of love. <clears throat> so, um, okay. So go back to First John for a minute. I want to look at verse 16, but actually just go back to verse 1. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called the children of God. I love that there, what manner. It means what sort of love or what quality of love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called the children of God. You know, think about that. We're the children of God. Um, And we weren't children of God, but we are children of God now because we were born of God. We were born of God. We're begotten of God, another scripture says. Um, actually, that, that's a very interesting term. In, in the Greek, it's two words. Um, I think it's anogenoa, something like that. And it means like, um, like again, beginning or again Genesis or again or a new start that's what begotten again means or born again means it's like a, another start, another beginning a new beginning 
the word regeneration comes from the same, uh, same words, regeneration. Again, Genesis. Again, new beginning. And <clears throat> um, where am I? Anyway, behold, of manner of love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called the children of God. Anyway, go we'll over to verse 16. <clears throat> By this we know love because he laid down his life for us so that's how we know God. That's how we know or perceive or recognize or understand love because he laid down his life. So if, if anyone says, well, what is love? Bring them to that scripture there. By this we know love. This is how we recognize love. God laid down his life for us because he laid down his life for us and we also ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. So that's really what I want to talk about. In the, you know, it's, it's, we're to lay down our lives for the brethren, the same as the Father sent the Son to lay his life down for us so that we be, could become his sons and daughters. Um, and what, what, what's really struck me lately when I've been just meditating on this is We're called to lay down our lives the same as Jesus was called by the Father to lay down his life. It's the same love that, that was in God and in the Son that's now in us who are also sons and daughters of God. And now the Father says to us, he says, I want you to lay down your lives the same as my son Jesus laid down his life. And... And as I've thought about this, I've seen it all over the New Testament in particular, um, where the, the writers of the, the likes of Paul and Peter and John are exhorting the church continually in their love walk, not just for the church, but also for the people in the world. Um, it's a little different when you're loving the world. It's how you treat people on the building site or in, on the job or, you know, uh, respect for the, the authorities of the land. Uh, but it's still the love of God in us for them, showing them respect, giving them honor. Um, and ultimately, it has the same, God has the same desire that the love of God would reach their hearts and they would be drawn to him because his servants and his children have manifested his his nature, his kindness to them, and they're drawn to that, you know. And but um, how we treat each other is even a deeper. Uh, it's really the love of God that we show to each other, and it, and and it manifests in things like loving kindness, tenderness towards each other, long suffering. Um, it's really beautiful, um, and. So let's maybe get into a, a few scriptures. Um, <clears throat> so let's look in verse 17. He says, But whoever has these world's goods and sees his brother in need and shuts up his heart from him, how does the love of God abide in him? My little children, let, this not, let us not love in word or in tongue, but in deed and in truth. Just don't just talk a good talk about love. Show it in your actions, in deed and in truth. <clears throat> By this we know that we are of the truth and, assure, and shall assure our hearts before him. For if our heart condemns us, God is greater than our hearts and knows all things. Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence towards God. Um, verse 23 says and this is the commandment that we should believe on the name of his son Jesus Christ and love one another as he gave us commandment ok <clears throat> uh, and if you go over to chapter what do I see now 
Yes, stay at the same chapter, verse 7. Um, Beloved, let us not love one another. Sorry, let us love one another. For love is of God, or it proceeds from God. And everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. In this, the love of God was manifested towards us that God has sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be a propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought to love one another. Um, Verse 12 says, No one has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love has been perfected or made complete in us. Um, uh, Verse uh, 16, We have known and believed the love that God has for us. God is love. And he who abides in love abides in God and God in him. Um, I want to just read a, um, another verse from verse uh, chapter 5. Um, and verse 1 says, Whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. And everyone who loves him, who begot, also loves him who was begotten of him. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. Um, So uh, he says, whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God and everyone who loves him who begot or who basically gave birth also loves him who was begotten of him. So, I am begotten of God. And he says to me, he says, now everyone else who's begotten of God, I want you to love them. That's what our family is. That's what family is. Family is is people in the same house who are begotten of the same parents, who are born of the same parents. And, And he says, if you've been born of me, then you need to love the other ones who have been born of me. Simple stuff, like, but at the same time, um, um, this is not an optional thing for the family of God. This is a command that we, you know, it's it actually, this is evidence that we're actually in the family of God, that we love one another. Um, it's very questionable he seems to be indicating that you couldn't be in the family of God unless you love each other. Um, Because the evidence that you're in God's family and God is love, so being a a child of God, a child of love, you're going to love each other. Um, And I think if we struggle in in, in this area of love, especially love for one another, it's because we just we just haven't really took the time to really look at the love of the Father and really meditate on what he did for us because that's our example. If God so loved us, then we ought to love one another. <coughs> Another scripture a bit like this is in First Peter. Uh, chapter 1 and verse 1. Um, let's see. So Peter is writing to uh, churches who were um, actually in modern day Turkey. Uh, there's regions around Turkey and he mentions them all here in verse 1. Uh, to the pilgrims, uh, sorry, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the pilgrims of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Petunia, elect according to the foreknowledge of God in sanctification of the Spirit. All these places are in 
what we would call Turkey today. Uh, verse 3 says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. So we're about to, to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead this week. And he says here that through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, we were bought, begotten again to a living hope. We were born again to a living hope. <clears throat> According to his abundant mercy, he has begotten us again. A second time, again, born again. We were born the first time of our mum, but we're born of the spirit a second time, born are begotten again to a living hope. Um, and how did this happen? It was through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Um, verse 4 says, when we were born again, we were born to an inheritance, incorruptible and undefiled and does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you. You who are kept by the power of God, through faith, for salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. <clears throat> okay. And if you go down to verse 22. Uh, uh, sorry. Well, actually, just go back to verse 18. Knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by the tradition from your fathers, but you were redeemed by the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without blemish and without spot. For indeed, sorry, he indeed was fore foreordained before the foundation of the world but was manifest in these last times for you, who through him believe in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, that, so that your faith and hope are in God, since you have purified your souls in obeying the truth, through the Spirit, in sincere love of the brethren, love one another fervently with a pure heart, having been born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible through the word of God, which lives and abides forever. He says here, love one another fervently with a pure heart. Um, that word fervently means intensely, earnestly, without ceasing. Um, the, one of my notes here in, in, in the footnote says the new birth brings inner purity which is manifested in love for fellow believers you know we're born again that manifests in fervent love um, for, for each other and uh, it's, it's a normal thing that we love each other fervently, that we, we and not just a wishy-washy love, but a sacrificial love, a, a love that cares, a love that doesn't think about itself, that lays itself down for the other person, uh, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things, a love that never fails, it never fades, it never gives up, it, it, it stays with it until the person receives whatever they need to receive that's the love of God that's in our hearts and, uh, and it's powerful and it's a love that's energized by the spirit of God that lives in on the inside of us it's a powerful love you know natural love in the world doesn't really have that 
but we've got the, the Spirit of God living in us. So when we reach out in love to our brothers and sisters, even to somebody in the world that's not a Christian or not born again yet, um, we have got the power of the love of God on the inside of us, willing and desiring to reach that person and m minister to them through us. It's powerful. So right through, actually, the, Peter was writing to these churches in Turkey. And they were going through lots of challenging things. There was, there was a pushback against their, their faith in Christ. And uh, so there was, you know, they were enduring lots of suffering and persecution and so on and so forth. So a lot of what he says is really to encourage them and exhort them. Um, and how to live their life. Uh, but there's a few other instances where, have I read them all yet? Um, just give me a second. Yeah, so First Peter chapter three and verse eight. <clears throat> He says, finally, all of... So he's after admonishing them about a bunch of different relationships, how to treat your husband and wife, you know, how to live on the job, how do you they respect in your government, etc., etc. And then he says, and all of you be of one mind, having compassion for one another. Now he's talking to the... He's talking to the believers and in the relationship to each other, he's, he's, he's has a little comment and he says um, ha have compassion for one another love as brothers be tender hearted be courteous not returning evil for evil or reviling for reviling but on the contrary blessing knowing that you were called to this that you may inherit a blessing um, so all of you be of one mind how, how can you be of one mind? Well, one of the things I've written down here is that if you're going to be in one mind with your brothers and sisters, then you need to get the mind of God. And where do you get the mind of God? From the Word of God. So if you're not in the Word of God, you'll probably not be in one mind. Um, the second thing he says, having compassion for one another. <coughs> or the Greek means sympathetic. You know, I think sometimes people in the world think being compassionate is, is weakness. Ah, that's how the sissy stuff. But, but God, being sympathetic and, and you know, um, having tenderness. Actually, the, the Greek word is, um, it's translated in the King James um, uh, bowels. But it's really talking about your inner um, sensitiv sensitivities. It's, it's really talking about, I, I need to find this actually, so let's see. I think I'll come to it later on, but, but, but compassion and sympathy and tenderness of heart is a quality that God wants us to show to each other. And it's not weakness. I think for us men, sometimes we think things like this are just, you know, ah, you're, a bu you're a bunch of sissies, you know, man up. No, God wants us to be tender to each other to show uh, kindness. You know, when, when Jesus walked the earth, we, we saw time and time again his, his tenderness towards people. You often see when God is ministering to, through different people, um, and you see just that the, the tender love of God being exhibited towards a person. And, and that's, the, that's the, the qualities of God's heart uh, that's in us. And, and he desires that we be compassionate towards each other, be sympathetic, show kindness, um, slow to condemn or to, to um, you know, the, to, a desire to cover a person's sin, not to expose their sin. You know, it's, it's so merciful. The love of God is so merciful and he desires that that be in us as well that we have things like compassion and sympathy. 
Um, having compassion for one another, love as brothers. And you know, well, what does that mean? Well, you know, in a family, and I know families, we fight and stuff, but, but still, families look out for each other. They care for each other. Um, and they could be fighting one minute, but if something happens, they'll all jump in the river after the one that's, that's, that's in trouble because uh, we're family, you know. And uh, how much more the family of God that we look out for each other, care for each other. If someone is struggling or, or hasn't got a, you know, food on their table, that, that we run to meet that need. We're family, you know. And, you know, I, every one of us come from families, some of them maybe dysfunctional families, but even in a dysfunctional family, you'll feed each other, you'll care for each other in some way. Um, how much more should the family of God care uh, um, intimately, care for each other. <clears throat> be compassionate for one another. Love as brothers. Be tender-hearted. Like I said, that's not weakness. That's the strength. Be tender-hearted. It's the love of God. Be courteous. Not re returning evil for evil. <clears throat> Amen. Um, So I want to, to go over to Ephesians then uh, for a few minutes. What time is it? We'll maybe just spend a little bit of time in Ephesians and if we have, have time, we'll go to Colossians. Uh, chapter 1, verses 1 to 6. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, to the saints who are in Ephesus and faithful in Christ Jesus, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places in Christ, just as he chose us in him. Look, look at this. He chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love or covered by his love. Isn't that beautiful? You know, this in the heart of God, before the foundation of the world, he chose us in Christ, that we should be holy or sanctified without blame before him, covered by his love, having predestined us to the adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good, good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace by which he made us accepted in the beloved. Man, there's the gospel in, in, three, in three sentences there. You know, I, I saw this a few years ago and I hadn't seen it before that. Um, that in the past, before the foundation of the world, he says here, uh, another scripture says, um, oh, uh, it speaks of the lamb slain before the foundation of the world. And I realized that God already knew in the, in the past, before he even made man, that man was going to fall that he was going to be plunged into a, a total mess and was going to be lost. And God, in, in, in his uh, foreknowledge, planned to redeem that situation by sending his son to a cross. And I mean, it's really beautiful. He chose us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and without blame before him, covered by his love, um, and then he says, and this is to the praise of the glory of his grace. So we're, not, we're getting none of the praise here. This is his grace that's getting praised. To the, bra the praise of the glory of his grace by which he made us accepted in, in, in the beloved. It was by his grace. 
that we are accepted in the who's the beloved uh, uh, the father remember the father spoke of uh, out of heaven um, and he says this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased hear him we are accepted in the beloved in Jesus in Jesus Christ um, and, and, and all of that was God's doing and all of that was foreordained before the foundation of the world, before we were, we were even existed. God foreordained in his foreknowledge to, sh to show mercy and to bring us into Christ, into the beloved. Beautiful. Um, and, and it goes on to say, verse 7, In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace. Um, anyway what I'm, I'm want to show you in that is God's love was displayed to us um, if you go to chapter 2 verse 4 um, what did I say well verse 1 says we were dead um, and you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins in which you once walked according to the course of this world. And I've looked down at verse 4. But God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love, with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, he made us alive. How did he do it? Together with Christ. That's how we were made alive, together with Christ. Paul says, my life is hidden in Christ. My life is in Christ. Paul says in another place, he says, I no longer live, but Christ lives. The life that I now live, it's his life I'm living. And so he made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. And he raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Look at this. That in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved. <clears throat> okay, anyway, what I've written here in, in reference to that, in the light of the great work of redemption, Paul prays to the Father for us, his, his family, his church. Um, and that's in chapter 3, verse 14. Paul prays, For this reason I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. Who's the family in heaven? It's all the saints gone before us. So God's family is in heaven and it's on the earth. Who's the family on earth? The church. The redeemed the believers, the, the ones who've received Christ, that's the family on earth. And the ones who receive Christ but have gone, they're, they're the family of God in heaven. <clears throat> that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with the saints what is the width the length, the depth, the height, to know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. So let's think about this for a minute. To, he says, that you may be able to comprehend with all the saints what's the width and the length. You know, we think of the length of something, it, it's, it's how long how long it is or how, how long the, the love of God gives us longevity um, what about the depth that's the capacity there's no bottom there's no bottom it's endless capacity the love of God has endless capacity uh, what's the other one height there's no cap on it <laughs> I've written here you know, 
it's the the love of God is just, just you can't box it in. It's it's limitless. To know the love of Christ which passes knowledge, that you may be f- filled with all the fullness of God. Um, I need to go past a bunch of good stuff here, and let's look at. Um, verse 17. So, the point that I'm making here, Paul talks about uh, what God has done for us in Christ and the position he's put us in. But then he starts to move on, like earlier in Peter and different places. He moves on then to exhorting the church about the, their love walk. So let's move into that in the next few verses here. Um, So verse 17 of chapter 4 says, And this I say therefore, and testify in the Lord, that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk in the futility of their mind, or having ceased to care. That's what that means. Having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart, and being past feeling, have given themselves over to lewdness, which means lack of uh, restraint, to work all cleanness with greediness. But you have not so learned Christ, if if indeed you have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus, that you put off concerning your your former conduct, the old man, which grows corrupt according to deceitful lust, and be renewed in in the attitude or the spirit of your mind, And that you put on the new man which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. So he's exhorting them here to to put on your new identity, the new man. And then verse 25, he says, Therefore, putting away lying, let each of you speak truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. Members of one another. We're, We're same family. We're members of one another. We're same family. Came out of the same womb. We're born of the same father. Amen? So speak truth. Don't lie. So he's starting to deal with specifics now. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath, nor give place to the devil. Let him who stole steal no longer, but rather let him labor working with his hands what is good that he may have something to give to him who has need. Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth but what is good for necessary edification uh, that it may impart grace to the hearers and do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption and then he says let all bitterness wrath anger clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice and be kind to one another tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. So you can see how Paul is now, he's talked about their background, where they've come from, who they are in Christ, the security of their eternity. But then he, so we don't stay there. Yes, we, we, we always keep that as a reference. That's where, that's where I am. I'm seated in Christ in heavenly places. I belong to God. I'm a son of God or I'm a daughter of God. My eternity, my eternal salvation is secure. But now God wants me to continue on that same love that's, that was on, on the inside of him when he sent his son to the cross. And the son, filled with the love of, of the father, going in obedience to the cross, now that same love needs to continue through, through the ones who were begotten of God as a result of that. That same love. So he starts to get real specific here. And you can see that in all the epistles where he, he comes really hard on these people. Come on, we need to love. This is serious. We, we need to love um, with the same um, power and potential that was in the love of God. When Jesus loved, it, it was powerful. But when we love, it's powerful too. And God wants us to know that and walk in that. 
Um, so verse 31 again, let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking, um, evil speaking, I have written here, word fighting, using words to fight, evil speaking, be put away from you with all malice and be kind to one another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. Therefore, be imita imitators of God as dear children <clears throat> and walk in love as Christ also has loved us and given himself for us. Um. Go to... Um, Uh, just another little one there. Uh, verse 21 says, submitting to one another in the fear of God. Um, submitting to one another in the fear of God. Um, so there are lots of different character things that God is, is desiring to develop in us. And here's another one. Submitting to one another in the fear of God. Um, <coughs> You know, what wives are told to submit to your own husbands. We're all told to, to submit and be submissive to one another. But he says to do this in the fear of God um, or with reverence for God. And, you know, I've noticed over the years that, for example, a, lo a lot of ladies would struggle with things like uh, wives submit to your husbands. But you'll not struggle with it if, if you do it in the fear of the Lord. Um, um, you know, I'll give you another example. So I am 62 years old. What age are you, Jason? 35. So here's the pastor of the church. And I'm supposed to, in, I'm supposed to be submissive to him as the one who leads. But he leads in obedience to God. He leads by the, by the anointing of God. And so, so he's in a position of authority and I'm actually in a position under that authority. So I'm told to submit to that authority. So in, in the natural mind, you might think, well, I'm 62, I've lived twice as many years as, is that whippersnapper there, you know? <laughs> But actually, I, I can do that easily uh, in the fear of the Lord um, because in my reverence for God, um, I, will, I, will, I will want to keep his order. Uh, and so it's easy for me to do that. It's, it's been easy for a number of years because I've, I've kind of meditated on it in different scriptures, but... Um, uh, so it's 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 easy when you when you stay in the order of God and the order of the Word of God, and stay in, in the order of God, submitted to God, then it's easy to to for a wife to submit to her husband, or for a a, a man to submit to his boss or work, or for a 62 year old man to submit to a a, a 35 year old pastor. That that's easy. Why? Because it's in the fear of the Lord. It's in reverence and respect and honor for the one who has my heart. He's got my heart. So it's easy for me to, to, to lovingly submit to Jason. Um, um, okay. Where was I? Verse 21. Yeah, in verse 20, 22 then, uh, so a scripture I was mentioned, wives submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. Uh, for the husband is the head of the wife. Well, what does that mean? Well, that's actually the order of God, as also Christ is head of the church. So this is the way God has set it up. The husband is head of the wife. The, 
and Christ is head of the church. You know, do we complain? Do we complain that Christ is our head? No. Uh, why? Because that's the way the fathers, that's the way God set it up. Um, and he is a savior of the body. Uh, therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let wives be to their own husbands and everything. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ has loved the church and gave himself for her. So you can see the context of, of submission here, the context of sub submission, um, seen as we're on the subject. Uh, a wife s submits to her husband knowing that as Christ loved the church, her husband loves her and, and is laying down his life for her. You know, it's easy to submit to something like that. Um, and um, I think it's really beautiful, actually, because it's, it's not as if uh, the, the husband lords it over the wife. That, that's not in this at all. Um, it's actually, um, it's just a beautiful order of God. If a wife submitted to a man who's laid his life, his heart is laid down to, to care for, to protect, to provide for this woman, and, and, and that's a type and shadow of Christ in the church. Time's up. I have lime gone past my time, so um, let's finish just one, one wee scripture over in, where is it? Philippines chapter 2, verse 1. I can find it. He says here, therefore, if, and this word if is also, you could translate it since. So if there's any consolation, or since there is consolation in Christ. Or you could say, if there's any consolation in Christ, and there is. That's how I would put it. If there's any comfort of love, and there is. If there's any fellowship of the Spirit, and there is. If there's any affection and mercy. And he's talking about, I believe he's talking about from God. So yes, if there is, and there is, there's consolation in Christ, comfort of love, fellowship of the Spirit, affection and mercy. Then he says, verse 2, fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one, of one mind. He's not talking about the same love for him. He's talking about the same love for one another. He says, just as you've received consolation and comfort, what is it? Consolation and comfort of love and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit and you've re received God's affection and his mercy, then fulfill my joy, Paul says, by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind, let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit. Conceit means puffing yourself up. But in lowliness of mind, <clears throat> let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but the interests of others. Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ, who being in the form of God, um, the New American Standard says, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but made himself of no reputation, or he emptied himself, taking on the form of a slave or a bondservant, and coming in the likeness of men and being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself 
and became obedient to the point of death. Again, you see, our example is Jesus. That's our example. You know, let this mind be in you, which also was in Christ. He made himself of no reputation. He took on the form of a, a bond servant, which it's the Greek word doulos, which means slave. It's not even the word diakona, which is servant. It's the word for slave. He took on the form of a slave and became obedient to the point of death, even the death on the cross. He says, let that mind be in you, which also was in Christ. And so we're to love one another with that, with that attitude. So that's something to meditate on, guys. Amen. Father, we just thank you for uh, your word, the depths and the beauties of your word, Lord. And there's just so much in there. And I pray, Lord, that um, uh, just the things that have illuminated in our hearts will not be stolen from us. Uh, commit everyone to you, Lord. I thank you for your blessing upon each one for safety as we travel home tonight. And uh, till we meet again, Lord. Uh, thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.